Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for organizing this wonderful um, symposium. Um, so welcome you all to my talk on long-lived spin states of hypopolarized hydrocarbon gases. This is the outline of the talk that I'm going to give today. And we will be talking about three different molecules in particular, propylene, cyclopropane, towards the production of hypopolarized propane, and then a recent work on hypopolarized dietal ether using ethylvanyl ether or EVE. So the, uh, all these compounds have been studied using the technique. So hypopolarized propane was produced from propylene via pyrovirus parahydrogen addition in the presence of rhodium titania as a catalyst. The motivation for this uh, work was, uh, as it was explained in like a couple of previous talks this morning as well, that this is a good way of producing a hypopolarized propane in a pure state, which is catalyst free. So we believe that uh, this uh, can be used as a potential inhalable contrast agent for a uh, magnetic resonance imaging in the future. The experiments were done in two different fields, a low field NMR spectrometer setup operated at 47.5 millitesla and at a high field setup operated at 1.4 tesla device. So uh, this is the schematics of the low field setup that we used which consists of three different parts, a parahydrogen generator, the propane polarizer, and the spectrometer. So in the parahydrogen generator, which is also shown here, that we used for this study produced 87% enriched parahydrogen, and then it was fed into the uh, propane polarizer using a separate line. So in the polarizer setup, we have the mixing chamber where we used uh, to prepare gas mixtures of interest, in this case, using parahydrogen and then operate as a molecule, which is propylene. And in, we have an addition line here as well, in case if we want to study, let's say, um, the cut of buffering gases on something, we can use this line, but we are not going to talk about the um, use of buffering gases in, these, uh, in today's talk. So uh, after preparing gas mixtures, uh, we send the gas mixture into a mass flow controller to get a desired flow rate. And the gas coming out of the uh, MFC is then sent to the heterogeneous catalytic reactor, which first undergoes a heating stage and then the gas reaction of this followed by a gas cooling stage. So the hyperpolarized gas mixture, which is coming out of the reactor is then sent into the spectrometer. So the gas is uh, sent in using a different valve into the internal gas phantom which sits inside of an RF coil inside the magnet. And the gas flow is then directed through another valve into the atmosphere. And there is a bypass valve connecting the input and the output of the gas line into the phantom. The purpose of having this um, bypass valve is to ensure a continuous gas flow when uh, the phantom is uh, phantom is closed for the gas flow by closing valve numbers two and valve numbers three. So we acquired spectra at a stop um, flow condition here. So this ensures an interrupted uh, production of hyperpolarized gas during spectral acquisition. Uh, so this is the actual picture of how the propane polarizer looks like. And this is the mixing chamber that we uh, talked about in the schematics. And the copper tubing which runs from here all the way through here is our catalytic reactor. So similarly, in, uh, we have the gas coming out of the reactor fed through an MFC, and then it goes to the high field spectrometer setup uh, to this one. So how uh, this is set up is uh, we have a line um, directing the gas into an NMR spectrometer from the bottom of that, and then the gas coming from the top of the NMR tube is then sent through a series of valves and into the vent. So this setup allows us to acquire spectra under two different uh, conditions. One at a continuous flow condition where both of these valves are open and we acquire spectra by the gases flowing through the spectrometer. And the other is the stopped flow condition where um, valve number two is closed immediately after closing the MFC, thereby trapping the gas inside. And then we do spectral acquisition on the stopped gas. Uh, the 
thermally polarized spectra were also collected in the stop flow conditions after letting uh, the hyperpolarized gas to completely uh, relax. These are the spectroscopy of uh, required for HP propane at 1.4 or the uh, high field uh, setup. And as you see here, this is the typical uh, expected pattern of the hyperpolarized uh, propane in the weekly coupled regime. Um, and these were done in Alderina conditions. So one, uh, one peak is looking up and the other proton is, is looking down. So this is the expected pattern. And um, so uh, this spectrum, which is shown on the P, was uh, acquired in a continuous flow condition. And this one was acquired at a stop flow condition. And the spectrum of uh, thermally polarized um, spectrum is given in C. And we also studied the effect of the temperature in, uh, towards the enhancement. So uh, from plot E here, um, we can say two important things. One is that a robust catalytic performance is uh, expected over a wide um, temperature regime. And the second one, or the more, impo the more important one, is that uh, we can still get reasonably high enhancement values by operating the catalytic reactor at room temperature. So this is great because we don't have to go for high temperatures for uh, HP propane production. Therefore, um, we can prepare vast amounts of propane, which can be great for imaging. So moving on to the spectroscopy at the low field, which is 47.5 millitesla. The major uh, problem that we have when we try to acquire spectrum in this low field regime is that we do not get the uh, anti-phase line behavior as we would expect in the high field, because this is a strongly coupled regime and the lines collapse. So we use a special um, technique that was uh, explained in detail uh, by Dr. Steven Givens yesterday, which is called spin lock induced crossing uh, pulses or slick pulses which enables uh, for us to see the um, singlet, to convert the singlet into an observable uh, triplet state. So um, here we observed a clear maximum of the slick pulse, uh, slick power towards the signal and the spectra were very reproducible. Thereby uh, we know that slick works well for the HP propane detection at the low field. Similar to the high field detection, we also studied the effect of temperature. So if you look at the plot C here, uh, the highest signal was obtained at around 40, 60 Celsius, which is good because it's closer to the human body temperature. And these are the uh, pulse sequences that were used uh, to acquire um, the signal at the low field. And you saw this slide yesterday as well, so I'm just going to go very briefly through this one. Uh, the pulse sequence B was used to study the TLLS data of the hyperpolarized propane. So we fill the chamber, uh, let it relax, uh, and send the slick sequence, and then FID detection. So we repeat this many times by varying the relaxation decay in order to get the decay data. So uh, the pulse sequence, which is shown from C, is the corresponding pulse sequence for HP propane T1 measurements where you have a small angle excitation pulse uh, followed by the decay repeated many times to get the T1 decay data. So at the same time, we wanted to try and see if the lifetime of the HP state can be increased by uh, deuteration. So we use uh, deuterated propylene as well. And this is the pulse sequence we use to obtain the uh, decay data for deuterated propane. So if you compare this sequence with the previous two sequences, the um, major difference is we do not use a slick sequence. So that is um, great and it is characteristic to the molecule that in because it gives us uh, anti-phase lines already in this field, it does not slick, uh, require a slick transformation. So this is an example of the decay data obtained uh, for uh, propane and deuterated propane. Figure A is the uh, decay curve of hyperpolarized propane, and figure C is the decay curve of hyperpolarized propane when long lived states are generated. And figure E is the decay curve of deuterated uh, hyperpolarized propane. 
The plots on the right are the pressure dependencies on the decay constants. Uh, as you can see, they show a linear dependence on propane pressure. And if you compare figures A and C, we can clearly see an increase of almost a factor of three of the lifetime of the hyperpolarized state when long-lived states are generated. But um, deuteration does not seem to benefit the lifetime of the HP state. However, though, as we were talking about this, uh, pulse sequences before, it, is, uh, it does not require a slip transformation for the signal acquisition, so that is a plus. So um, to recap what we know so far about hyperpolarized propane is that uh, we can prepare vast quantities of hyperpolarized propane, preferably by operating the reactor at room temperature. And the um, lifetime can be increased by creating long-lived spin states. And if you use the degraded molecule, we don't even have to use a slick pulse. Nice. So the next question would be, what's next, right? The next comes imaging. And uh, we have a 0.35 Tesla MRI scanner already delivered to our lab, and we hope it will be uh, installed soon. So propane would be a great candidate to be used on this device because the chemical um, shift difference is in the order of uh, spin-spin coupling. And we also uh, envision to do large animal studies using sheep. So this would be the direction where propane project would head for the next three years. And on a separate note, uh, we were trying to think if there is a way that we can even we can create even longer lived spin states of hyperpolarized propane. So we switched to cyclopropane. And cyclopropane has been shown to produce uh, hyperpolarized propane with high polarization values before, and this is in uh, this does not undergo uh, hydrogenation over a homogeneous catalyst. So this work, which was done by Oleg and co-workers on the uh, heterogeneous hydrogenation of cyclopropane, suggests three different uh, products, which can be uh, occurred from three different reaction routes. But um, two of those are symmetric states, therefore NMR invisible and only one product can be detected by NMR. So we used this um, study as a background to see and learn if actually route numbers two and three are happening. The way we approached this was through deuteration. The experiments were designed uh, using two different molecules, again, cyclopropane and propylene for the comparison, and we studied their deuterated products. So this is the experimental setup that was used. Similar to before, there is a mixing chamber and the gas mixture is sent through an MFC into the reactor, but the gas here is collected in a different way. The gas coming out here is collected into an HPLC column filled with deuterated methanol. And then we uh, fill NMR tubes with the product and uh, acquire spectra at uh, 700 megahertz Bruca NMR spectrometer. And those were the thermally polarized products. So what did we see? Um, these are the um, product proton spectra of um, methyl and methylene regions. So the blue trace here represents the products obtained from uh, propylene deuteration, and the green trace here represents the product obtained from cyclopropane deuteration. So if you compare the two spectra, you see um, there is a good overlap between the blue trace and some parts of the green trace which suggests that there is a good agreement of the products present from route number one, consistent with both methyl and methylene regions. But these additional spectral features and their high intensities indeed suggest the presence of additional spin isomers, which we, I think, can be attributed to uh, route numbers two and number three. So I'm going to emphasize uh, one thing here that we try to, we indeed try to do simulations to see uh, if we can simulate the spectra of all the products obtained from cyclopropane, but uh, it is a complex system and we did not succeed yet. So at the same time, we wanted to see um, the contribution of each reaction route as a whole by comparing their branching ratios under two different experimental conditions, uh, one with cyclopropane excess and the other with deuterium excess. 
So the way we approach this was by um, using the signal in intensities to compare uh, the contribution of each route. So uh, the observations were that regardless of the reaction conditions, uh, we did not, uh, the branching ratios were similar and we indeed see a difference in chemical conversion. So uh, this is a still an ongoing project and for the experiments are uh, for the experiments and simulations are indeed needed, but we hope that even longer lived spin states for high porous propane might indeed be possible. So with that, I'd like to move into the uh, third molecule, which is hyperpolarized diethyl ether that was uh, produced uh, by using EBE. So diethyl ether, as we all know, is the first anesthetic produced on commercial uh, scale. Although it is no longer used in the United States due to uh, flammability issues, it is still used as a medical anesthetic in some of the countries. So uh, we think by uh, making few developments, we will be able to use this as a potential inhalable contrast agent for uh, pulmonary imaging. And similar to before, uh, the experiments were done in two different fields, a high field and a low field. And we studied both the liquid diethyl ether and the gas based uh, so the high field experimental setup is shown here. In this case, we used 99% um, enriched para hydrogen sent through a mass flow controller into the pressurized um, NMR tube with the uh, catalyst and the precursor molecule. And after bubbling for a certain amount of time, uh, we stopped the gas flow and the spectra were collected at uh, 1.4 NMR spectrometer. So this is the resultant expected uh, spectrum of the hyperpolarized diethyl ether in the liquid phase, and this was our signal reference. We also studied hydrogenation kinetics by varying the uh, parahydrogen bubbling time. And this plot here shows the um, percent polarization versus the reaction time. I want to mention that for each of these uh, spectral measurement, we used a new sample. And all of these are averages of five different measurements. So what we can see here is at around eight to 10 seconds, we see the highest polarization values, which was around 8.4. And also we see um, complete conversions fairly quickly at around again, eight to 10 seconds when the graph plateaus here. We also studied the relaxation uh, data of hyperpolarized diethyl ether in the liquid, both at 1.4 uh, and at the Earth magnetic field. And these were the data obtained uh, for the relaxation. So moving on to the gas-based study, which was done in the low field. Um, this is again, very similar to the propane uh, spectrum propane experimental setup that we use, which has a, the generator, the polarizer, and the spectrometer. The major difference here is in the polarizer section where you um, bubble the parahydrogen through the MFC into an HPLC column filled with neat EBE here. So in comparison with the propane setup, uh, we all know that this is not a very stable um, setup, even though it is good for preliminary studies. Which it me what it means is um, this can change over time. So if one would want to measure the decay data, you would have to uh, use a different approach. Then comes partial slick, which we use to obtain the decay data. So how it was done is um, the chamber was filled, and then a slick pulse uh, was uh, applied followed by the decay, and these two were repeated many times on a single fill. So obviously by approaching the partial slick uh, approach, we can have some magnetization losses. So in order to correct for the magnetization losses, we used a different approach using uh, the liquid diethyl ether study, which is shown here. So we compared the relaxation data acquired for the liquid diethyl ether uh, without using a slick pulse and with using a slick pulse. So the solid trace here is the data, TLLS decay data of uh, the liquid diethyl ether without using a slick pulse. And the dashed uh, decay curve here, the dashed line here represents the data 
collected after applying a slick pause. So by dividing um, 14 by 7, which is shown here, we calculated the correction factor uh, when partial slick was used. So this correction factor was then applied on the gas-based data. So these are the results of the diabetes ether gas. Um, the plot A shows the typical spectrum, uh, the typical hyperpolarized spectrum acquired at T1.4, and its inversion recovery data suggests a T1 of 1.2 seconds. And the plot B here is the uh, slick spectrum of uh, diabetes ether gas at the low field, and B shows the relaxation data. So uh, by fitting the data, we obtained a TLLS of around 2.8 seconds. But since this was done using partial slick, um, the actual TLLS should be even longer than this, which is using the correction factor, we obtained a value of four seconds. So we can clearly see uh, the long-lived spin states of hyperpolarized diethyl ether gas can, be, uh, can indeed be produced uh, by using this approach. Uh, lastly, I want to mention uh, something interesting as well. So this is a, we were able to observe racer conditions for diethyl ether as well, for as low concentrations as 40 millimolar and without using an RF pulse. So uh, this is a recently observed phenomenon, uh, an observation in our lab, when doing PIP experiments using commercial spectrometers. So I'm not going to be talking uh, many details about this, but um, I know you're interested, so please listen to uh, Baptiste talk tomorrow um, and his um, poster presentations, uh, which will explain about the race conditions in detail. So with that, uh, to conclude uh, we, about high polarized diethyl ether study, we could see high levels of proton polarization and there is clear evidence for the existence of the long-lived states of hyperpolarized diethyl ether gas. And uh, therefore, we think this could be developed as a contrast agent to be detected uh, using clinically available MRI scanners with proton detection. And also, we think alternative precursors uh, diet like divinyl ether can even uh, give us double payload uh, towards polarization. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Ed, and the FIP team, and everyone from our lab, as well as all the collaborators, collaborators listed here for their enormous support and these uh, funding sources. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your great talk and this extensive study. Uh, the questions are very, they're very different questions on this one, so I hope you can answer them. Um, first of all, you, very early on in the talk, you showed pressure versus T1. Do you know why your T1 goes up at higher pressures? This one's right. Yeah, that's, so, I, that's uh, I have a few more questions about. Yeah, so uh, how we did this was uh, we used a different, so um, we used different um, uh, pressure valves for the safety valves and then uh, did the study in the uh, different pressure regimes. So uh, I believe what's happening is uh, when we increase the pressure, uh, the decay, uh, uh, so this is higher, so the decay becomes slower because we are uh, introducing um, so, um, restrictions to the flow. Okay. Yeah, that's what I believe. Oh, so it's due to the flow. Oh, that's interesting. Sure. Okay. And secondly, about the cyclopropane, is there, are there any systems where you do that in the liquid phase so that you could potentially see hydrides and maybe study catalytic intermediates? I know this is gas phase, but... Uh, that could be, but we've been more interested in the gas phase. Uh, I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, there, that could be. I just, yeah, we never tried that, so. Okay. And it's and really an ongoing work, so we might as well try that, so. Yeah, you, you're doing, doing gas phase, I, I, I see. And finally, about the razor one, uh, is that in the gas phase or in the liquid phase? Uh, 
this was a in the liquid phase. So what I showed here was in the liquid phase, but uh, we tried to use the gas phase on 1.4 Tesla device as well, and so erase the spectrum, but we yeah, didn't even bother analyzing it further because um, we don't have like controlled, um, a good controlled gas phase uh, set up to do this study yet, so. Yeah, but to my knowledge, there is no paper about gas phase uh, SIP raises. Uh, yeah. That would be new. We, we had this spectra actually, yeah. We had some of the spectra acquired. And then one comment that just came in while we were talking about this, the pressure dependence of T1 for gases is a feature of the spin rotation relaxation mechanisms. So it may not be only your, art, your flow that's contributing to that. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you very much for showing these exciting data and this extensive study. And